Yesterday we started with Gordon Allport worrying about the self and arguing that it's more, it's easier to feel the self than to define the self. And we began to talk about what the self looks like from a cognitive point of view. And what I want to do today is to continue with this general idea of the self as a mental representation of oneself. That's basically all there is to it. We talked last time about two different views of the mental representation of the self. The self is a concept, a list of features or something like that, that distinguishes oneself from other people. Or the self is image, kind of analog-based representation that uh, uh, represents the uh, physical features of the self. And what I want to do today is to turn mostly to a third view of uh, the mental representation of the self, which is simply to think about the self as a knowledge structure that is uh, that's stored in memory, uh, representation of the self in memory, much like uh, we represent our knowledge about other people in memory. So again, if you think about the self as a memory structure, um, the general idea here is that we've got some verbal propositional knowledge about the self, uh, propositional type statements that, that, that describe the self, either with respect to episodic memories, representations of specific episodes in the person's life, specific actions or experiences, or um, semantic self-knowledge, that is, representations of the person's more or less enduring characteristics, whether they're physical characteristics or psychological characteristics or, or, or social um, and characteristics. All this should be familiar to you because we talked about this exact uh, view before when we talked about person memory, social memory, that is, how we represent knowledge about other people uh, in memory. And you'll remember uh, our example was this um, uh, knowledge about James Bartlett, professor at the University of Texas in, uh, in Dallas, who is kind and thoughtless. That's semantic knowledge about James Bartlett that we might have. And that he rescued the kitten and that he caused the accident. That's episodic knowledge about James Bartlett that we had. But I want to add something new here, which is that's what James Bartlett looks like. Okay, so. Uh, even though we talk about verbal propositional representations of knowledge, there's no re reason why there couldn't be a link from the node that represents this person, James Bartlett, to some node-like structure that represents what, um, what, this guy, uh, what this guy looks like. So that's, my men that's a, a schematic of my mental representation of James Bartlett, somebody that, uh, that I know. What would it look like if we got inside James Bartlett's head and looked at his mental representation of himself? Well, it would look like that, okay? You'd have this node that represents the self and James Bartlett's knowledge that he's a kind person and that he uh, is thoughtless and his memory that he rescued the kitten and that he caused the accident. Uh, we'll add that his name is James Bartlett. That's something he knows about himself. Uh, and he also knows that he looks like this. And if you were looking very carefully, you'll notice that this is a mirror reversed image of the one I said I, I showed you before. Because this is, what, this is how he sees himself when he gets up in the morning and shaves in front um, of, the, of, the, um, of the mirror. But the general idea is that the structure of James Bartlett's self in memory looks an awful lot like the structure of my mental representation of James Bartlett in, um, uh, in my memory. And again, just to kind of review the bidding uh, uh, for a while, uh, one of the things that has um, concerned people who are studying both our memory representations of other people and our memory representations of ourselves has to do with how episodic and semantic self-knowledge are, um, are organized with respect to each other. This is what we call the independent, independence view of the self, where there's a node representing the self, and then there are these associative links out to nodes representing other kinds of self-knowledge, some of them being pieces of semantic self-knowledge, like the self is neurotic and the self is extroverted, um, and also um, uh, episodic knowledge, like there was an occasion where um, 
Uh, I felt tense and jittery or went to pieces under stress or liked the stranger or wanted to be with others or whatever. This is the model that seems to be suggested by research that we conduct in person memory, that is men, uh, mental representations of other people, but you'll remember from those lectures that there are other possibilities. So for example, there's a hierarchical uh, view of the self where the self is connected directly to nodes that represent semantic self-knowledge, uh, that the self is a neurotic extrovert, and then these uh, nodes representing semantic self-knowledge are themselves connected to other nodes that represent episodes in the person's life that exemplify the uh, generic characteristics, the traits uh, that are in question. So be feeling tense and jittery, that's an episode of neurosis. Going to pieces under stress, that's an episode of neurosis. Liking a stranger, that's an, extra, uh, an episode of extroversion and, uh, uh, and so on. Now there's a third view, which I talked about very briefly when we discussed person memory. I just want to touch base uh, with it um, uh, right now, which is what you might call a computational view uh, of the self. This is the view that is, um, uh, that is implied by a famous theory in social psychology known as self-perception theory, which basically says that we don't carry around in our heads any semantic self-knowledge. We don't carry around in our heads knowledge about our attitudes and our beliefs and our traits or anything like that. What we do is, when we're asked what our attitude is, we compute what our attitude must be based on knowledge that we have about how we've behaved in the past. So for example, if I'm completing a, 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 a personality self-rating scale and I come upon the question that says, how neurotic are you? I cast my mind back on previous episodes in my life, and I determine how often I've felt tense and jittery, how often I've gone to pieces under stress. If I'm asked how extroverted I am, I cast my mind back to my previous um, uh, episodes of life and determine how often it's been that I actually met a stranger and liked them right off the bat, or how often I wanted to be with other people, or so on. Notice that trait self-knowledge isn't represented here at all. That's why it's called a computational view of self, because the idea is that when you're asked about what you're like in general, you kind of compute an answer to that question online based on the retrieval of various, uh, various um, uh, episodes in, uh, in memory. Now, you'll remember from the lectures on person memory that evidence overwhelmingly favors the independence view of self, the idea that uh, uh, the independence view of person memory, the idea that semantic and episodic knowledge about other people are represented independently. Now, if you thought, as I've been arguing, at least implicitly, that the self is just another person represented in memory, with the exception being that the person is you as opposed to somebody else, well, then you'd expect the self to look like this as well. You'd expect that um, trait information like neurotic and extroverted would be represented in memory independently of episodic information like feel, uh, felt tense and jittery or wanted to be with others or whatever. So let's see if that's actually the case. Okay? These are just a comparison of the three different models for mental representations of self in, um, uh, in memory. The first kind of evidence that bears on this is evidence from priming uh, uh, effects in self-judgments. And again, this is work by Stanley Klein at the University of California, Santa Barbara, who has done more than anybody else to kind of argue for this independence uh, view of, uh, of self-knowledge. And uh, in, in a series of studies, Klein and his colleagues have made use of this priming paradigm, which you should be familiar with by now, Priming is simply a phenomenon where the performance of one task facilitates uh, performance on some other uh, the task. Um, there's positive priming where one task facilitates performance. There's also negative priming where the first task impairs performance on the second task. Negative priming is something we're not going to discuss here. It's A, too complicated. B, it doesn't matter for the purposes of this discussion. And third, you will tear your hair out getting 
um, negative priming effects. Do not try this at home, right? It's just, it's, these are very difficult um, uh, to, to get. So what Klein did with respect to self-knowledge is exactly what he and his colleagues had done with respect to um, our knowledge about other people uh, stored in memory. He presented subjects with uh, trait adjectives, adjectives like neurotic and extroverted, under, uh, under three conditions. In the first, he asked subjects simply whether the trait was characteristic of themselves. So the word neurotic appears on the computer screen, and subjects have to press a button that indicates whether that uh, trait is, is, uh, is part of their self-concept or not. In the second condition, subjects had to recall an autobiographical memory in which they displayed the trait in question. So again, the word neurotic comes up on the computer screen. Even the most well-adjusted of us here have behaved neurotically at one time or another in our lives. Uh, so uh, what the subject has to do is simply recall a time when he was neurotic and then press a button as soon as he's remembered um, uh, that, uh, that episode. And then uh, in the third condition, uh, the subjects were simply asked to define the term. So they were asked, does neurotic mean anxious? And then you press a button that says yes or no, as opposed to does neurotic mean happy or something like that. So that's the basic thing. It's just a, it's just a standard reaction time um, uh, task. And what um, Klein was looking for was evidence of repetition priming. So what he wanted to do was to look at the effects of one task on reaction time in the next trial based on the relationship between these uh, trials. So if there actually is priming, you would certainly expect if task one, the first trial, w asked the subject to define a trait, then if on the next trial, the subject was asked to define the same trait, you'd get a priming effect. Similarly for recalling episodes, you'd expect priming within a task, and for describing traits, you'd, have, you'd expect priming within a, a task. But what Klein was really interested in, mostly interested in, was what we might call a kind of semantic priming effect, where there's not a lot of overlap between, um, between the tasks, so does recalling a trait-related episode prime self-description judgments? Or does uh, making a self-description judgment prime recalling a trait in memory? And remember, the logic here is, there we go, that if our knowledge about ourselves is organized in this way, asking a subject to make a trait-based judgment about the self should prime recalling trait-based episodes, okay? Because you activate this node and activation spreads down here. At the same time, asking somebody to recall a trait-related episode should prime self-description judgments because the only way to get to the episode is through the trait, okay? So that by the time you get down here, you've already activated the trait node. So if you've got a, a situation like this, where episodes of behavior are organized by, are subsumed by, are, are if they fan out from the traits that they uh, re represent, you'd expect to see these kinds of priming effects. And if you remember what Klein got when he looked at person memory, judgments about other people, you know what he got when he looked at self-memory. So here we have the three, priming, the three priming tasks and a control task where there was no priming task, okay? And then we have performance on the target task, and this is response latency, okay, in terms of um, uh, uh, seconds and milliseconds. So what you can see here is that if you describe yourself on trial one, there's facilitation in describing yourself on trial two. That's the priming effect. If you retrieve an autobiographical memory on trial one, you're primed to retrieve an autobiographical, when you try to retrieve an autobiographical memory on, prime, on trial two. 
If you're simply asked to define the trait on trial one, there's a priming effect if you're asked to define the same trait again on the immediately succeeding, uh, succeeding trial. So there are priming effects in this situation, but there aren't the kinds of priming effects that are critical to, uh, to the question of whether self-knowledge is organized by traits. So, for example, describing, where are we here, okay, retrieving an autobiographical memory doesn't particularly prime self-description judgments, okay? There is, that's the priming effect right there, okay? And for that matter, uh, defining, uh, uh, the, describing yourself on a particular trait doesn't prime the retrieval of an autobiographical memory related to that trait. So we don't have these kinds of priming effects that you'd expect to see if episodic information was organized by semantic information. Instead, the lack of priming that we observe across tasks where describing oneself doesn't prime retrieval of autobiographical memory, retrieving an autobiographical memory doesn't prime self-description uh, the judgments, is exactly the pattern that we would expect if semantic and episodic, if trait and autobiographical information were, uh, were uh, represented in memory independently of each other. And that, uh, that is, in fact, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the conclusion of all these studies. There are now a bunch of these studies that have been done, in part because when Klein first published these results, nobody would believe them. Right? They thought, no, oh, this is a crazy way to, to, to uh, organize the memory. There, that, that, that is not to have your memory organized by traits. But every time somebody tries to do this study, they get exactly what Klein got uh, the first time. So there's priming within knowledge categories. There's priming within the category of semantic self-knowledge. Making a trait judgment facilitates making that trait judgment again. There's priming within the category of episodic trait knowledge. Remembering a time when you were neurotic makes it easier to remember a time when you were neurotic on the next trial. But there's no priming across knowledge categories. Uh, performing a semantic self-reference task doesn't facilitate the retrieval of, of, of autobiographical memories. And retrieving autobiographical memories doesn't actually facilitate making, uh, making self-reference uh, judgments. So that's the general uh, uh, the idea here. And again, if you remember our discussion, which you should, because it was just on the exam, if you remember our discussion uh, from, um, uh, from person memory, this should be no surprise. What Klein has also done, however, it's always nice to have converging evidence from several different paradigms. So what Klein has been able to do has been to um, uh, get additional evidence for uh, the independence of episodic and semantic trait and behavioral self-knowledge from a different kind of paradigm entirely, uh, and that is to say neuropsychological paradigms involving amnesic patients. The representation of self in amnesia is particularly interesting because amnesic patients, by definition, do not have memory for, do not have episodic memory. They don't have memories for, uh, for particular um, events and experiences. If you think about the late patient H.M., uh, H.M. had an operation that excised large portions of his medial temporal lobes in 1953. He just died in 2009. And for that entire period of time, some 54 years, 55 years, H.M. Uh, had absolutely no memory of anything he did or anything that had happened to him or anything that happened, uh, uh, that happened in the world. So what happens in amnesia is that you don't have episodic self-knowledge. You don't have any memory, any conscious memory anyway, for specific episodes of behavior uh, or experience. Now, nobody asked this question of HM, largely because social psychologists and personality psychologists didn't get anywhere near um, uh, the HM, and the cognitive psychologists who worked with him on a daily basis never thought to ask this question. But the question is, you take an amnesic patient who can't remember any specific episodes of behavior or experience, does he still have any sense of what he's like 
as a person. Does an amnesic patient have any knowledge about himself on, in terms of what his traits and attitudes and behaviors are? Remember that from the point of view of the computational model of the self, if you lose access to your memories, you don't have anything else because we don't, uh, the, the computational model suggests that we don't actually store generic self-knowledge about our traits and behaviors. We have to compute uh, that information um, uh, online. Well, when um, uh, Klein first published his claims about the independence of self and of uh, 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 semantic and episodic self-knowledge, um, Endel Tolving, who's uh, an important pioneer in the neuropsychology of memory, says, hey, I think I have a way of testing this. Uh, Tolving was at this time working with uh, a fairly famous amnesic uh, a case known as KC. This isn't HM. This is everybody, these guys are always known by their initials, or almost always known uh, by their uh, initials. KC was uh, a young man who uh, was involved in a motorcycle accident at age 30, and basically he um, uh, spilled over his handlebars and landed on his head. Um, and um, uh, as a result of this head injury, uh, uh, experienced uh, displayed a profound amnesia, uh, uh, both a, a retrograde amnesia uh, that resulted in the loss of personal memories from, uh, from the period before the accident, and an anterograde amnesia, which um, simply means that since the accident, he's not been able to lay down any new memories. Now, these kind, this kind of brain damage always causes an anterograde amnesia, okay? Um, the damage to the medial uh, the portions of the temporal lobes, uh, hippocampus and structures like that, always renders the person, uh, it gives the person an anterograde amnesia, which means that they can't lay down any new episodic memories uh, since, uh, since the accident. In some cases, this same brain damage will produce a retrograde amnesia. And what was interesting about the case of KC is that the brain, the, the, his retrograde amnesia was so extensive that it covered his entire life. That is, after the accident, KC had absolutely no ability to recollect anything that he had ever experienced, anything that he had ever done for his entire life. It wasn't one of these nice temporally graded things where you lose a couple of hours or a couple of days or a couple of weeks. I'll show you such a case. Um, in a minute, he lost everything. Moreover, it turns out that as a result of the accident, and presumably as a result of other brain damage that he, uh, that he uh, 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 suffered, uh, Casey underwent a personality change. Um, before his accident, uh, what's known as your pre-morbid personality, before your illness, uh, he was very extroverted. That's why he was riding a motorcycle without a helmet in the first place, okay? After the accident, however, uh, Casey became very introverted, very withdrawn, uh, not angry or anything like that, just uh, very, uh, very shy and, uh, and ill at ease about, uh, about people. So the question that Tolving posed based on a reading of Klein's article is, hey, what about Casey? Casey doesn't remember anything about what he's done in his life. He doesn't remember riding a motorcycle without a helmet. He doesn't remember any of the other extroverted things uh, that, uh, that he did. Does Casey have any appreciation of what he's like as a person? Does Casey have any appreciation now that, uh, that, he's, uh, that he's introverted um, as opposed to extroverted or whatever? So Tobin uh, uh, did the, the following really interesting study in which he went to Casey with, a, with an adjective checklist and simply asked Casey to, um, to rate what his personality was like. Now remember, this is really quite an extraordinary thing to ask an amnesic patient to do, especially one like Casey, who can't remember anything he's ever done in his life can't remember any specific episode uh, in his life, to say, what do you like? Okay? Uh, and in addition, uh, uh, what, what uh, Tolvin asked uh, Casey to do was to, uh, was to rate what he was like before his accident and what he's like now. 
And then Tolving went to Casey's mother, who was still around, and asked her to rate what Casey was like before his accident and what, um, what, he's, uh, what he's like now. Uh, the data's a little complicated, but I'm going to present you the, 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 uh, the salient points. So here we have ratings of Casey's post-morbid personality. Remember, before the accident, he was kind of extroverted. Now, since the accident, he's quite, uh, quite introverted. And if you look at, if you compare Casey's ratings of himself versus his mother's rating of what he's like, you get a very high correlation. Q is a special kind of correlation that Tolving used for, for, uh, for particular purposes. We don't have to get, uh, get into that. But like any uh, correlation coefficient, uh, correlation coefficients range from minus one, meaning there's a perfect negative association between two variables, through zero, a random association, to positive one, meaning there's a perfect positive association between uh, two variables. 0.77 is pretty high for a correlation coefficient. There's actually quite good correspondence between Casey's rating of himself now and his mother's rating of himself right now. Casey seems to have a pretty good idea of what he's like as a person, despite the fact that he can't remember anything that's happened to him since the accident, or for that matter, uh, before the accident. And just as a comparison, uh, Casey was asked to rate what his mother was like as a person, and she was asked to rate what she was like as a person, and you also got a very high correlation. So KC is able to rate accurately the, pers uh, 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 the personality of some other person, and he's actually able to rate, uh, uh, rate his own as well. Here's a little bit more uh, detail. Uh, when Tolving compared KC's pre-morbid to his post-morbid uh, 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 personality. And what you got here, first, he asked Casey to rate his, what he's like now as a person, his post-morbid personality, on two separate occasions. And um, those two ratings showed a very high level of agreement, about 76%. So Casey's not just guessing, and he didn't just happen to guess right the first time. He's actually making reliable judgments about, uh, about himself. Casey's mother's ratings of his pre-morbid personality versus his post-morbid personality showed only about 50% agreement. And the way this data was collected with two alternative forced choice um, uh, 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 responses, that is simply a chance. He's a very different person now uh, than he was uh, then. Um, Casey's rating of what he's like now versus his mother's rating of what he was like now, again, very high levels of agreement, much higher than you would, ex uh, would expect uh, by chance. Casey's rating of what he's like now versus his mother's rating of what he was like before, again, levels of agreement falls, do uh, falls down to chance. Casey doesn't necessarily have much appreciation that his personality has changed, but he does have an appreciation of what he's like as a person. Casey has a fair amount of semantic self-knowledge, even though he is utterly lacking when it comes to, uh, to, a, to episodic self-knowledge. And the fact that you can, that amnesia can dissociate semantic and episodic self-knowledge in this way suggests that episodic and semantic self-knowledge are represented independently in memory. You can lose access to one, but retain access uh, to, uh, to the other. Endel Tolvin's work on uh, patient KC inspired um, uh, Klein and his colleagues. Uh, Stan Klein was my student when I taught at Harvard. That's one of the reasons you get a lot of Stan Klein. I just does wonderful work. has nothing to do with me. Um, uh, but he did involve me in this particular, uh, on the particular study. Um, when you do work on amnesia, uh, uh, you usually um, uh, have a little kit of tests that you could go off and give on a, on a, on a moment's notice. And uh, 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 Klein had one of these. Uh, and uh, when the, the, in, in the course of his teaching, he stumbled upon a case of a student who had a temporary uh, re uh, retrograde amnesia. And this became the case of WJ, uh, because those aren't 
her initials, okay? She was an 18-year-old college undergraduate. She was, in fact, a, f a freshman in the second quarter uh, of, her, uh, of her freshman year. And um, in the course of some vigorous activity in her room, um, she fell out of bed and uh, sustained a concussive blow uh, uh, the, uh, the, to the head that uh, rendered, uh, her, uh, rendered her amnesic. As often happens in, uh, in, in these cases, she experienced an anterograde amnesia, which means that she has basically no memory for anything that uh, she did. She was conscious, uh, but she has no memory for anything that she did for about 45 minutes um, uh, uh, after the injury. That's the anterograde component of her amnesia. But interestingly, uh, she also suffered a temporally graded retrograde uh, amnesia. She was completely amnesic for uh, the events of her life uh, covering the previous six or seven months. Uh, now, this is, this is an absolutely fascinating feature that you often encounter with um, uh, a traumatic retrograde um, amnesia, which is if you're doing the calculation, she's, she, this happened to her in the middle of her second quarter of her freshman year, February, March, so, okay. Um, then she had a retrograde amnesia to six or seven months. Her amnesia basically went all the way back to high school graduation. She could remember things from before high school graduation, but she couldn't remember anything that happened between high school graduation um, and now. This temporal boundary to retrograde amnesia occurs quite often, in, even in cases of brain damage. Um, uh, I remember uh, a, a particular case of a guy who was rendered amnesic because he grabbed a high tension wire. Uh, he's lucky that the amnesia is all that happened to him. And it knocked out all of his memories back to his wedding day. He could remember everything up to his wedding day. After his wedding day, it was all gone, right? He got it back later. You get recovery from these, uh, from these retrograde amnesias, and the amnesia cleared in 11 days. But for those 11 days, uh, WJ was not able to remember anything um, that she had done for the, previous, uh, for the previous six or seven months. As I say, uh, Klein was ready for this. He had a little kit of, uh, of, of a memory test to, uh, to, uh, 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 to do. So uh, when, uh, when, when he found out about the case, uh, he got permission uh, to, uh, the WJ's permission, in fact, to, uh, to test her and gave her a bunch of things. Um, the, uh, this is just a nice documentation of, the, of, of her retrograde amnesia. This is a procedure known as the Krovitz-Robinson technique. Do I have this here? Yeah, oh, the galton cued recall technique. It's, another, it's, a, it's an alternative name for it, where what you do is you present a, um, you present a, uh, a noun or a verb or an adjective or something like that, and then you simply ask the person to remember um, uh, uh, an event that is related to that word. So you put up uh, automobile, and you say, oh, I remember that I was almost in an accident in the rain yesterday, or something like that, okay? So in any event, what uh, uh, the Klein did was to present these items to, uh, uh, the, the, these, these cues to WJ, asking her to remember a, a, an event from her own life that's related to uh, the, the cue word, and then also, um, uh, Klein repeated this with a group of control subjects. These were other 18-year-old college freshmen, uh, basically same, uh, same age and uh, college status as, uh, as WJ. And what you see um, uh, here is the proportion of memories that came from various periods in people's lives. The control subjects in dark, in, in dark blue show you the typical gradient of autobiographical memory. If you ask people to remember the things that they've done, they usually remember things from the very recent past. This is the last uh, 12 months. And then memory kind of falls off. There's a nice temporal gradient uh, 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 to that. But WJ showed exactly the reverse pattern. She had almost no memories from uh, dated within the, uh, the last 12 months. Remember, she was amnesic for the previous six or seven months, and most of her memories were from the mo uh, most remote past. That's a very nice documentation of her, and of, her of her retrograde amnesia. This is what she looked like 
11 days later, after she recovered her memories, there is recovery from traumatic retrograde uh, amnesia. And uh, here, the performance of WJ is essentially indistinguishable from the performance of the uh, controls. So for 11 days, especially for the first part of those 11 days, she was amnesic for anything that she had done uh, over, the past, uh, over the past six or um, that past six or seven months. So what Klein then did was to ask her kind of what, what's, what she's been like during that time, to look at semantic uh, uh, self-knowledge. Some of you may have noticed that when you come to college, it changes you. All right? You don't just get smarter. You don't just learn physical chemistry or whatever it is you're taking in, um, in, in school. But the, the experience of being away from home, being with new people, being in a, in, in a new environment, uh, will actually have an effect on changing your personality. And in fact, most students, when they come to college, do experience various kinds of personality um, uh, changes. Uh, so um, it's a perfectly reasonable uh, 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 thing to expect that um, WJ's own personality would have changed by virtue of her first half a year uh, or so in college. And the question is, would she, uh, have, would she have any idea uh, about that? So Klein did essentially what Tolving did, gave WJ a, uh, an, an adjective uh, the checklist just to describe uh, herself. And uh, as, a, as a check, instead of when, what, where, where uh, Tolving relied on Casey's mother as a check, um, Klein went to WJ's boyfriend. Okay, said, what, what's she like? Okay. And what you got was pretty good agreement, a correlation of 0.65 between WJ's ratings of herself and her boyfriend's ratings of what she's like. Um, when you did this with the control college women, asked them to rate themselves, and then went out and surveyed their boyfriends. They all had boyfriends. Okay. Um, you got the same amount of agreement. Uh, so uh, it seems that WJ knew what she was like now, despite the fact that she couldn't remember anything that she had done for the past six or, uh, six or seven months. Uh, Klein also uh, asked WJ to rate what she was like in high school and compared that to her ratings of what she was like in college. There is some correlation uh, there. You're not, you know, it changed entirely. You know, you don't, you know, become an entirely different species. Or, well, some people do. Uh, when, uh, when, you, uh, when you get to college. So there's some relation between her current personality and her high school personality, okay? Um, but when you look at her test, re test, re test reliability, if you ask WJ to rate what she's like now on a couple of different occasions, again, you see very uh, high correlation. So her, um, her uh, 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 self-knowledge is reliable, basically the same amount of... Um, reliability as, as you get in the controls. And WJ's knowledge of what she was like then is, does not account for her knowledge about what she's like now. These two correlations are significantly uh, uh, different from each other. So again, what we've got here is a second instance where you have episodic and semantic memory about the self episodic and semantic self-knowledge dissociated in cases of amnesia. Amnesic patients remain, retain some idea about what they're like in general, what their personalities are like, even if they can't remember any of the events in which they um, displayed those particular traits. Okay, so there you go. That's the general idea here. Amnesics retain knowledge of their personalities, even if they forget knowledge of events. And that confirms the, um, the, the findings from the priming studies uh, that um, uh, trait and behavioral, episodic and semantic uh, uh, self-knowledge seem to be represented independently uh, in memory. Now, uh, Klein and his colleagues have done a couple of other uh, cases uh, like this. Um, uh, I'll actually skip over this because there's something else um, I, want to, uh, I want to point out here. Oh, yeah, well, I'll, okay, I'll do this one. This, this is another case. This is a case of DB, um, who um, uh, suffered a heart attack, basically, while he was watching a basketball game. Uh, there was uh, a loss of blood supply to the brain uh, and uh, created, a, uh, created a, a, an amnesia. That can happen um, uh, to you. 
And basically, here you can see the, ex exactly the same thing that happens. Uh, DB lost memory for, what, for, for his experiences, but he retains memory of what he's like um, as, a, as a person. The interesting thing about this study was that Klein asked DB not just to remember his past, but also to project himself into the future by asking questions about um, uh, what are some of the most important issues in the world over the next 10 years, or what are you going to do tomorrow? And it turns out DB can't answer questions about, like, about episodes of the past. What did you do? What do you do? What, what did you do yesterday? Though he can answer questions about history. He, can, uh, he retains knowledge of, 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 of history that doesn't um, involve him. DB also has no idea what he's going to do tomorrow, even though when you ask him what are some of the most important issues over the next, that, that we're going to see in this country over the next 10 years, he has a fairly good uh, idea of what those uh, kinds of things are going to be. Suggesting, interestingly, that the ability to imagine the future may be related to our ability to remember the past. And um, uh, there's, a, there's now a lot of interest in the idea that memory uh, is the, uh, uh, provides the basis for imagination, uh, provides the basis for, uh, for prediction. Okay, so that's the self as memory. Uh, episodic memories, autobiographical memories, if you will, and personal memories. There's one other aspect of the self as a knowledge structure that I just want to uh, uh, draw your attention to quickly, and that is because if you think about how we've characterized episodic self-knowledge um, uh, for now, there's kind of an unsatisfying quality to it. James Bartlett rescued the kitten. James Bartlett criticized the waitress. Uh, I uh, was uh, uh, jittery. Um, uh, I uh, liked the stranger or whatever. These events seem to be disconnected with each other, and that's not our experience of our autobiographies. Our experience is of a, 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 our autobiographical experience, our self-narrative, if you will, really consists of a story that has a kind of beginning and a middle and an end. And so, in addition to thinking about the mental representation of self as a concept, or as an image, or as a bunch of um, uh, unrelated memories, we can actually begin to think of the self as the story that we tell about ourselves, as a kind of narrative, uh, if, you, uh, if you will. And uh, the basic idea for this story model of knowledge, and rep of knowledge representation comes from Roger Shank, who's a cognitive scientist, does a lot of work in artificial intelligence, and Robert Abelson, the late Robert Abelson, who was a uh, very, important, uh, very important social psychologist, who argued I'm not sure they're right about this, but that's, this is their, uh, their theory, that all human knowledge is based on stories that we construct around past experiences, and that when we have a new experience, we interpret this new experience in terms of old uh, stories. And they argued that these stories, especially stories about ourselves, constitute what they call the remembered self. Uh, the general idea here being that your self is what you remember about yourself, but you, what you remember is not just isolated episodes, but rather a more or less coherent story. And they further suggested that, if we sh that story memories that are shared within members of a particular group define particular social selves. When you go home and visit your parents for holidays, you probably don't tell them everything you've been doing since you've been on campus, right? Um, and when you talk to your friends here, you probably don't tell them about every stupid thing you did as a junior high school student either. Um, those stories are shared within a particular social group, and uh, the, the pattern of shared memories Shank and Abelson proposed will help us to define particular context-specific social selves. If you look around you, if you look at the kinds of books that are sold at Barnes & Noble and Amazon, you'll see that the self as a story is a very, very popular literary form these days. We're experiencing 
what has been called a memoir boom. Uh, if you look at best-selling uh, books in Barnes and, no uh, and Noble, they're almost always memoirs. Uh, it's amazing uh, how many people will buy a memoir by a person that they don't know anything about, right? Just want to read the memoir. And there's a whole history to this. Of course, in early fiction in the, 18th and, uh, the, the 17th and 18th centuries, there were a lot of uh, novels that were written in the first person. Okay, that's a very common literary device. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, most memoirs that were written were memoirs of other people. My time with Napoleon, or my time with uh, Queen Victoria, or something like that. They were memoirs that, were talk that talked about a person's experience with some other person. In the late 20th century, however, we began to experience in literature a kind of boom in the memoir as a literary format, and for the first time we get a proliferation of memoirs in which people are writing about themselves. Um, uh, tune in Oprah or, uh, or, or something like that. And every other episode, I think, she's interviewing somebody who's uh, flogging some memoir on the market. Uh, this passion for memoir has actually uh, influenced academic writing now. We're getting a lot more uh, uh, examples of first-person academic writing. Uh, journal articles are always supposed to be dispassionate, you know. 32 subjects were run in this particular experiment. Now people want to say, I ran 32 subjects uh, in this experiment over in uh, departments of, uh, of literature, whereas a previous generation of scholars would write about Dostoevsky's crime and punishment, the new generation of literary scholars write about their reactions to Dostoevsky's crime and punishment. There's actually a new novel reviewed in the New York Times book review, a new memoir um, reviewed in the New York Times Book Review just this past week about a person's experiences reading Dostoevsky, you know, which is interesting. What's going on here is that there's kind of a self-performance, which, which, which suggests that there's more to autobiographical memory than simply a string of disconnected episodes. And we're coming up to the end of, of, of the hour here, but I just want to point out that so far, when we talk about episodic self-knowledge, when we talk about autobiographical memory, we haven't really captured autobiographical memory as the story that somebody tells about uh, him or herself. Autobiographical memories are not just episodic memories. That is, knowledge about events that have a unique location uh, in space and time. In the first place, autobiographical memories are autobiographical memories. They're about the self. They make explicit reference to the self. Uh, they make explicit reference to our own cognitive, emotional, and motivational states. Moreover, and this is what's missing in most accounts of autobiographical memory uh, to date, is that the self as story has a kind of Aristotelian plot structure. That is the kind of plot structure that would make Aristotle happy, if you've read the, uh, the poetics. First. These episodes are not disconnected from each other. They're arranged in a causal sequence. Our lives have a beginning and a middle and an end. Second, our episodes of experience are causally related to each other. One episode creates the possibility of another episode. And in our memories, there we, we, we represent the causal links between one episode and another. And then finally, our autobiographical memories are not simply a hodgepodge of episodic memories. They're memories, we remember the things that we remember largely because they are somehow relevant to our character or to what Alfred Adler called our lifestyle. Our memories shape our personalities, but our personalities also shape our, our memories. And the things we remember, we remember in part to remind us of who we are and the stories we tell about ourselves, we tell in part to communicate that self-knowledge, that self-awareness, that self-perception to other people. Okay? So, what does the self look like? From one point of view, the self looks like a concept. From another point of view, the self looks like an image. From the third point of view, the self looks like a memory structure. From the fourth point of view, the self is the story that we tell about ourselves. Next week, we'll turn from kind of disembodied cognitive psychology and take up 
the prospects for social cognitive neuropsychology and neuroscience. Thanks. Have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday.